episode 35 with Berge Fagerly. 36, not 35, you dumbass. Welcome to the Sustainable Cell Development Podcast, where it's all about becoming a better version of yourself over time in a sustainable way. I believe in practicality over theory. Instead of motivation, you will find solutions. Instead of analyzing the reasons behind your problems, you will learn how to actually solve them. Instead of visualizing your goals, you will take actual steps towards them. So get ready to geek out on fitness, lifestyle, and behavior change. Improving ourselves is the point of life, and it starts with the human body. Hey guys, Abel here with the Sustainable Cell Development Podcast again. And hereby we have another really cool episode with someone very special that I've had the pleasure to talk to before. And he is none other than Norwegian strength coach and fitness expert, Berge Fagerli. Berge has been in this game for a long time. He has published a book named The Biorhythm Diet, and he has published a lot of great work on circadian rhythm optimization and eating according to your body's natural daily rhythms and cycles. And he is actually the man behind the training technique called Myo Reps, which is a rest pause type metabolite type training, and it has become very popular in the bodybuilding world. So all in all, he is a super smart guy with a lot of deep insight with regards to training and nutrition. Now, the last time he was on the podcast was over a year ago, and at that time we did a sort of overview on his general philosophies when it comes to training and nutrition, as well as just living an all-round happy, awesome life. That was a super cool episode, and this time I thought it might be cool to get his take on a different topic, namely ad libitum dieting, or intuitive eating, as some people call it, or just simply eating without tracking your calorie and macronutrient intake. So we geeked out a little bit on how someone can maintain good body composition, stay lean, support his muscle mass without weighing and measuring his or her food intake. This is a concept that is frowned upon a lot in the fitness world with the rise of flexible dieting and if it fits your macros type setups. Most of the fitness world is very skeptical when it comes to trying to get lean or simply maintain your leanness without tracking your food. So it will be interesting to get the take of someone who has coached some of the best physique athletes in the world and has gotten himself into great shape as well on this. So get ready to potentially get some of your views on dieting and long-term nutritional strategies challenged here, depending on what your views are, of course, And by the way, we also delved into aggressive versus slower cutting and whether or not dieting represents a straight path to developing an eating disorder, as some people claim. So lots of cool topics here. Hope you will enjoy it. And without further ado, let's get into this interview with Berge Fagerly. The topic of today is ad libitum dieting versus flexible dieting or macro tracking. So as we know, flexible dieting gained a lot of reputation in recent years, and it was a big discovery for many that they can kind of fit in any kind of food into their macros, as long as it actually fits their macros. And now the whole idea of eating without tracking your food is kind of seems like something that is only possible if you're willing to accept a lot of fat gain. Uh, but I know that you and many other people like Eric Helms, Menno Henselmans are able to maintain their body composition without tracking. So from a 10,000 foot view first, what would you say, how would you say macro tracking compares to ad libitum dieting? I guess uh, for most people with a modern lifestyle and uh, uh, modern food choices, to put it that way, most of them would need to do some sort of macro tracking to uh, to estimate or to even know where they're at calorie wise but uh, as you mentioned both me Eric Helms Menno and a lot of um, uh, a lot of the good coaches have implemented this uh, successfully and I would like to add there are several populations uh, all over the earth that manage to do this just fine and you can also see this in some of the elite athletes of course they have a a uh, huge training volume and intensity, which uh, allows them to uh, basically eat whatever. I mean, if you, if you probably a lot of you have seen the um, Michael Phelps food intake outline. I mean, he's eating like 10,000 calories per day, but he's also expending that amount of calories. And 
he actually needs to eat junk food uh, in order to get in all those calories. Uh, but for the most of us, um, I'm I'm uh, I'm confident in saying that most of us could also uh, follow an ad libitum dieting um, outline and, and still manage to get lean and uh, build muscle and look great and feel great. You know all the flexible dieting and micro tracking. Uh, some of them would still like to have some, uh, you know, cheat foods or free meals or whatever. And um, just accounting for all the calories they're eating, then having a piece of chocolate and having some pancakes, having a burger, stuff like that. It's it's still going to be within the daily calorie goals. And that's also obviously operating within a framework of having uh, the calories in, calories out being the main driving factor of success. Uh, whereas, you know, people who have been following me for a while know that I'm also taking into account um, uh, how healthy you are, uh, your overall lifestyle, your stress, your biorhythm. I mean, the biorhythm and circadian rhythm research has been a huge interest of mine for <clears throat> the last two or three years. And um, just... Um, you know, looking at how you can uh, manipulate nutrient partitioning just by altering how you approach light activity and nutrient intake. Um, so basically at the same caloric intake and caloric expenditure, you can direct more nutrients towards um, energy expenditure and muscle building uh, versus uh, fat storage. Uh, there's, uh, you know, not a lot of good research, but there's some research, um, you know, kind of pointing in that direction in, in how we can um, how we can manipulate meal timing and and, um, and food intake and uh, basically our overall lifestyles and, and achieve better body composition as a function of that. Right. So. Well, when we when we talk about uh, ad libitum dieting, what would you say are the couple of non negotiable uh, rules that one has to adhere to if if they want to make this work? Well, I can mention more than a couple. Um, you you could you could say that food intake is a factor of your appetite and uh, the satiety index of of a food. Uh, I mean, most people have a relationship with um, the satiety or the fullness factor uh, of a given food. Um, and there's actually a concept called the fullness factor from nutrition data uh, where you can go and look up uh, various foods and how filling they're uh, considered. Um, and then the data is, is uh, both calculated and, and I think there's also some subjective uh, factor involved there, but it's mostly based around the energy density of that food, how many calories per volume. Uh, so, for instance, um, cornflakes would have a higher calorie density or energy density than an apple would. Or, uh, or um, you know, at the other side of the spectrum, you have vegetables, which have a very low caloric content per 100 grams compared to something like bread or, or cereal. Uh, there's also the protein content of a food. Uh, it's generally considered that up to a certain point, the protein of a food would uh, make it more uh, satiating. So chicken would be considered more uh, filling than the same calories from a piece of bread, for instance. There's also not only for the specific food, but also for the meal composition. I mean, this is something we can get back to later on, but um, whether it's low carb or high carb, whether it's high fat or low fat, but, but basically there's some reason to believe that ketogenic diets can be more satiating uh, for most people. So in, under ad libitum conditions, a ketogenic diet can um, make people spontaneously reduce their caloric intake. 
Uh, but this is also seen at the other end of the spectrum with high carb, low fat meals where just, I mean, even with, with, uh, there's been experiments with pure sugar and people just can't, can't, uh, consume as many calories uh, with, uh, pure carb sources, uh, where you have an extremely low fat intake. And, and I've also seen this in clients. I've had clients, um, uh, following an extreme high carb, low fat with a moderate protein intake. And, uh, they managed to reduce their body weight and body fat just fine and also improve, uh, all of the met- metabolic, uh, parameters as well. Um, next point is fiber content. So, uh, more, uh, more fiber generally equals more satiety. Uh, you have, uh, the starch or resistant starch content where some foods, for instance, um, you know, baking a potato and cooling it off will, um, increase the resistant starch content. Resistant, resistant starch is generally not considered digestible by the human body and, um, it works more as a prebiotic. It works as, um, food for the friendly gut bacteria. It doesn't actually contain as much calories as uh, pure carbs do. And finally, you have, you know, how much do you need to chew a certain food? Um, something with a high, uh, you know, the viscosity of it, how liquid it is. Um, I think we all know that eating an orange will be more satiating than uh, making a juice out of it and drink, drinking that orange. And so that also plays into this. Right. So, um, uh, like when we, when we talk about these factors, like food choices are an obvious one, but what do you think about kind of the mindset to internalize? Because as we know, if someone hears that, okay, I can eat these, like these are good foods to eat, they're satiating, they will naturally make my calorie intake. And then their mindset is like, okay, I'm just going to load up on these and eat as much as I can. Then it, it's probably not going to result in very good body composition outcomes. So what do you think is the mindset that people should adapt when they sit down to eat their meals the most important one is is generally being more aware of how hungry you are um and being mindful of the food and i always tell clients that you know if if they want to go out and eat at the restaurant or eat pizza or eat something that they really enjoy then actually enjoy it. I mean, sit down and, and really focus on all the flavors and, and uh, the texture of it and um, and uh, enjoy it at, at its fullest potential. Because um, it's been shown in several studies, and I think most of um, most of the listeners here, here will also uh, know this um, that if you're distracted, if you're um, talking to people, if you're watching TV, if you're uh, reading on Facebook, if you're doing something to distract yourself, then you can automatically consume more calories than your body actually needs. So just, you know, sitting down and focusing on the food and and becoming aware of, you know, the full sensory experience of that meal will make you spontaneously reduce your caloric intake. And while also being more aware of how hungry you really are. Um, I mean, there's a saying that the Americans or the Western world will tend to eat until they're full, whereas some of the countries known for eating foods that aren't really considered healthy, such as the French, I mean, they will have uh, bake, bakery uh, items and they will eat butter and they will eat cheese, they will drink red wine. But their approach to eating is way different. They will eat until they're not hungry anymore. Um, there's also a saying in, Jap- in Japan where uh, they will before every meal say hara hachibu, which means um, literally eat until you're uh, an eight on a scale of one to ten on how full you are. So, you know, where ten would be uh, just, you know, uh, bloated and uh, extremely um, full, then an eight would be, you know, comfortably full. So just eating until you're comfortably full will be, um, you know, a lot more conducive to ad libitum dieting. 
Uh, there's also the, the, uh, the matter of ego depletion. In psychology, you have this, you have this uh, principle where uh, after a long day, if you've been running on uh, your, um, your resources uh, of willpower all the time, um, if you've been forced to just do stuff that aren't really something you, you want to do, if you've been uh, being told what to do all the time uh, and generally just being really tired and, and uh, you know running on empty when it comes to willpower, then if you go shopping or if you make food, it's a lot easier for you to resort to unhealthy choices or eating way too much just simply as more of an emotional uh, pacifier versus just a physical uh, fullness sure sure and um and when we talk about ad libitum dieting again versus tracking your macros what population do you think would most benefit from it so obviously when someone's getting ready for a contest prep then tracking their macros is pretty much non-negotiable but do, what goals do you think it is viable for so for example do you think someone can viably cut and reduce body fat by eating ad libitum and what kind of population what kind of training advancement and just general personality would most benefit from this uh well i think uh, most people would benefit from some uh, macro tracking uh just to learn how to properly estimate uh, food portions and how to uh, design meals that are satiating. Um, so, so f as a learning experience, I would actually have everyone do some macro tracking for a while. But I think long term, uh, no one can actually, or I guess some people can, but this also um, ties into the ego depletion concept. If, if you're constantly worried about counting every morsel of food that passes your lips, eventually you're going to, you know, um, it, it added up to other lifestyle or stress factors. It's eventually going to be uh, difficult to, um, to stay the course with the macro tracking. And you're going to run into situations where optimal meets uh, life and you're going to, have to do some, um, you know, have, have some flexibility in your food choices and, and you're going to have to, you know, eventually cave in. I mean, it's, it's going to be, um, uh, it's, it's going to be almost um, mandatory for everyone to have a flexible mindset when it comes to food and not think of it in, in black or white terms or zero, a hundred percent where, you know, there's nothing in between uh, perfect or being a fat slob, basically. I mean, it's called excluding the middle. And, and for most intents and purposes, I would prefer that most people would, would stay somewhere in, in between uh, those extreme ends, endpoints. Um, and we know for a fact that most athletes don't actually do any macro tracking. They're eating ad libitum and uh, they're doing just fine and they're lean and, and ripped, most of them at least. Um, so I guess it depends on how obsessive you are and how focused you are on, on that sort of lifestyle. If you're a fitness model or you're someone competing all the time in, in fitness or physique, uh, then obviously you would need to do some sort of macro tracking throughout the year. But for most people just interested in, in looking lean and feeling great and um, maybe focusing on their family or their, uh, you know, sports or uh, their business or whatever, um, or having a social life, then that libidum uh, diet will work much, much better and uh, allow some flexibility and some freedom. And I think that freedom is uh, on my on my end as well. I mean, I've been doing this for almost 20 years now uh, as a coach and also competing in both uh, in, in bodybuilding and you know trying all sorts of um, different sports. And it, it gets to a point where you get uh, the macro tracking gets very tedious. Um, 
And you also realize that if you just entrain better food habits and lifestyle habits, then it's, it's not actually needed to stay comfortably lean. I do know that if I want to get really ripped, then I would need to uh, control my calorie intake more and uh, suffer some hunger and, and less, uh, lethargy. But um, for the most part, it's, it's just not something I'm willing to uh, direct resources into as there's so many other things that uh, are taking my time and focus at the, at the moment. I hope that answered your question. I was rambling for a bit there, but I think in general that's um, the macro tracking is something you, everyone should learn, uh, but for not the 99% of the population interested in looking good and feeling great, um, ad libitum diet, dieting would be the long term goal. I think. Right. Awesome. Perfect. So um, I guess basically, can we conclude that? Um, most people can stay reasonably lean without tracking macros. And if they want to, like the flexible dieting mindset can still be implemented. So for example, if you go out for a re into a restaurant, then you can still eat some junk food or whatever, uh, uh, as long as you stay mindfully. So it's not this clear dividing line between this is flexible dieting and macro tracking. This is ad libitum dieting. And there is no gray zone in between those. Would, would you say that's that's correct? Yeah, I agree. I think you should be able to adapt according to uh, the environment or according to your uh, challenges, basically. And, and just, um, you know, you need to keep the overall picture in mind. The overall lifestyle is, is, uh, is going to be the overarching main principle to have in place before you can even consider whether you should eat, uh, you know, a baked potato or a baked potato with butter. I mean, it's it's... Uh, you know, people get so obsessed with the minor uh, details, the major and the minors, as uh, the saying goes. Um, and we're also, uh, at least some of us are, um, there might be a genetic component, there might be some uh, inheritable traits there, but it also could be the environment that some people will, you have to eat to live or the live to eat personality type, where some people just eat because it's fuel. They don't get any particular enjoyment from it, whereas others are, they use food as an emotional um, an emotional thing, and, and they get a lot of um, uh, enjoyment out of food. And, and so making it as tasty as possible, the palatability factor basically, and um, you know, the, the sensory, uh, the perception uh, factor of it all. I mean, uh, it's, it's, it's called a buffet effect where some people would go to a buffet and they would just, you know, eat all sorts of flavors and all sorts of food. I mean, you could be full from eating chicken, but then you switch to the cake and then you can have twice as many calories easily. Uh, Whereas someone that's, you know, only considering food as something to get done with so they can move on with their day, they wouldn't really, uh, they wouldn't really go all out on a buffet. They would just have a little of this and a little of that and, and be done with it. So, so there's so many different personality types involved as well. But, um, I've seen the emotional leaders. Um, I, I have trained the emotional leaders to become way more relaxed with food and uh, be able to just, you know, have that cake, have that piece of pizza, have that chocolate. I would eat, I, I will even plan chocolate into the dice of people um, as long as their emotional needs are satisfied and as long as they're eating uh, sufficient at every meal instead of trying to force themselves to, to starve because they, in their mind, believe that that's going to lead to success. And then they just end up overeating and getting, uh, you know, a bad conscience and overdoing everything. You know, moving away from the extreme ends and into the middle is, is going to be the, you know, the better strategy for, for most people, basically. Awesome. Perfect. So um, I, I, I love that you brought that up because just uh, to kind of close that up another topic that I'm, I'm sure I've seen that I wanted to touch on is this idea of aggressive dieting versus slow and steady 
dieting because um, obviously the standard recommendation is to take it slow. But as we know, going fast occasionally can build motivation in the beginning and some self-efficacy. So do you think there is a place to take drastic measures and, and to go really aggressively or what, what are your take on this? Well, extreme measures would be necessary if someone is extremely overweight uh, because just getting them down into a more healthy body fat range is going to you know, get their inflammation down and get their metabolic parameters uh, down into a more healthy range where everything just works much better. Uh, you, you kind of also get a, like a reset of the hunger and fullness uh, signaling, the leptin signaling, all that good stuff. So um, extreme obesity, I think in most cases requires an extreme approach where you just quickly get the weight down. And then you can start building the, the lifestyle habits and the food habits that makes it sustainable over time. Um, obviously also a competitor being behind in their contest prep would need an extreme approach. Uh, I also sometimes favor, uh, you know, an extreme like a protein sparing modified fast once in a while, just, um, you know, be, between periods of, uh, you know, stressed out, um, a lot of work, a lot of having to uh, focus on all kinds of stuff where you tend to eat stuff that aren't necessarily good for you um, while traveling, while, you know, just, just being, uh, having periods of being an emotional eater, basically. So uh, where you tend to gain more fat, um, you know, you go partying, you go doing stuff and just sometimes you just want to, you know, not give a fuck. <laughs> and so in between those periods, maybe having a week of um, a protein sparing modified fast or just once in a while, I'll, I'll have like one or two days per week of a protein sparing modified fast. And it feels almost like a detox. Not that I believe in, you know, detoxing the body, but it feels like you're, you're, you're kind of feeling cleaner. I mean, you, you have a high fiber intake, you eat some uh, low fat protein sources and uh, you can just by adding one or two of these low calorie days per week, see the body fat drop back to where it started within, you know, just a month or so. Uh, but for most people, for the long term, you would uh, most of the time need the slow and steady approach because um, you know, there's a reason why the statistics say that 95% of diets fail. Um, I mean, you can argue the actual percentage of it, but, but it's a fact that having a dieting mindset versus a lifestyle aspect uh, or mindset uh, makes people fail eventually. I mean, you meet the ego depletion concept again, where um, the longer you do it and um, the lower body fat you have, and you will always be battling hunger or feelings of being perfect or imperfect. And so having having an extreme approach, extreme calorie deficits is, is going to kill your progress eventually. You're going to just hit a, hit a wall and then, you know, go all the way to the other end of ex extreme. And uh, you see this all, all the time in competitors. Um, where they would have an extreme competition diet, do endless amounts of cardio, um, get stage lean, maybe even win the contest, and then two weeks later, they're like 10 kilos up from their stage weight, just because they, it's uncontrollable. And then some of them almost never uh, get back. I've, I've had clients approach me after you know, one and two years after the last contest, never having been able to recover their uh, good eating habits or, or lifestyle habits. And, and, and they're at the point where they're almost obese. Wow. Yeah. So my clients, uh, you know, not to blow my own horn here, but my clients almost don't feel like they're dieting until the very last couple of weeks before stage time. And after the contest, we just 
eat the same foods and just increase the calories and, and they feel great and they, you know, gain maybe uh, two, three, four kilos and, and um, most of it is just glycogen and fluids and, and some of them even start leaning out further uh, post-contest. So it just goes to show that having a, a sane approach to it and a more long-term approach to it would be the better option um, for um you know, adherence and, and uh, just general mental health. Right. Perfect. And then my last question to you on this is, um, I've read it, I delved into some kind of eating disorder kind of literature just because of the some of the content that I want to put out in the upcoming uh, time. And basically all the popular books out there and even a lot of the literature seems to basically draw a straight line between dieting and eating disorders. And I don't know if you have any uh, thoughts or experience with this, but what do you think of this idea that if we diet, then basically we will always be at risk of developing eating disorders. And then if you we want to overcome these things, then we have to stop dieting. What do you think about this concept? I wouldn't be quite so reductionistic in my thinking. Uh, there's a whole lot of uh, stuff going into developing an eating disorder. And um, I even talked to my fiance about this uh, last night because we're watching a TV show where, um, you know, someone were uh, discussing how they, you know, they didn't, uh, you know, they were being bullied at school and they were having issues with their family and their social life. And so they developed an eating disorder. And some for some people, uh, the eating disorder is not about a diet. It's not about consciously restricting calories to get lean. It's about control. It's about um, having one outlet to control their emotions. Or um, in in a life that's overall so chaotic that they feel out of control, where they can't control anything because shit just seems to happen to them all the time, then the one thing they can control is their hunger, uh, their food intake, um, their caloric expenditure. And, and so they will just uh, find um, a tremendous amount of pleasure from seeing how they can manip manipulate their scale weight. Uh, there was even... Um, a girl that found an immense pleasure in controlling her weight to the 100 gram range where um, because there would be like a, a certain limit that if she went to the doctor and weighed herself and if she was like 100 grams below that limit, she would get sent to an institution. If she was 100 grams over that limit, then she would be considered within you know, the, the limit of being healthy. And so every time she went to the doctor, she would weigh exactly 100 grams over that limit. So in her mind, it was all about control. It was not about, you know, the dieting mindset uh, in itself. And so if anyone thinks that it, it's as simple as saying that, well, a diet will, you know, eventually make you borderline uh, eating disorder, then I think that's just way too simplistic. Um, it, there's just so much going into that. And I've had people dieting and, and improving their lifestyle and their approach to food, you know, because sometimes you need to starve cravings um, to get rid of them. I've had people just drop sugar, drop chocolate, drop alcohol, uh, drop all of these high caloric, highly satiating palatability foods that the food industry know will make us overeat uh, completely out of the, their diet for, you know, four to six weeks at a time and then gradually add them back in and having sort of a, you know, it feels almost like a reset button. So um, then they start to enjoy fruits. They start to enjoy vegetables. They start to enjoy because we, we're kind of programmed to enjoy the foods that we eat. And so um, uh, just getting back to a baseline and then adding in some tasty foods now and then made their whole approach to foods a lot more healthy. So I, I definitely believe dieting can be done in a healthful way and, and, and lead to a better outcome 
than, you know, just always ending up uh, with an eating disorder or having a higher risk of develop- developing an eating disorder. I think it boils down to what approach you uh, choose, not just the diet in itself. Awesome. That's a brilliant response. And if I can just add one comment to that, like sure. actually when we talk of dieting, um, in my experience, like actually being really hungry during a more severe diet is can be sometimes the most effective way to like program yourself to appreciate these foods because when you're lower on calories and then you eat an apple it's like oh my goodness like the pleasure of that apple you, you don't give a shit about ice cream or anything like that so that's in a way a good training to retrain better kind of uh, eating habits and behaviors yeah it reminds me of that eddie murphy stand-up show uh where he uh, says, well, if, you, if you've been starving for, uh, you know, two weeks, then having a Ritz cracker is going to be like the most incredible experience of your life. I mean, mm, that's like the best time cracker I ever had. Yeah. He obviously compared it to having sex where, you know, not having sex for a long time and then, you know, getting laid would be, well, no matter what uh, type of sex it was, it would be the best time experience or best time of sex you ever had just because you haven't had it for a while. Exactly. So I think that goes uh, with food as well. <laughs> awesome. Perfect. Cool, Berge. Thank you so much for coming on. Uh, yeah, it's, it's been a pleasure having you on. Maybe just one last question because the last time when I asked you about like your life philosophies, it was very popular on YouTube. For people who you know just want to maintain good body composition, a good fitness lifestyle, but they also want to you know enjoy their life and make it a sustainable uh, endeavor for the rest of their lives, what one piece of advice would you tell them, or what was one thing? one mental kind of concept that you embraced in your own life and that was very helpful to you, if this question makes any sense? Well, I've always been a fan of Dan John. Uh, he's, he's a great coach, I think. And, and uh, he said it best in one of his books or uh, presentations or whatever it was, um, eat like an adult. And I mean, you know, it's, it's uh, in, instead of, um, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, <laughs> Picking the simple solutions uh, because eating junk food and processed food is the easy solution. It, it doesn't it doesn't take an, anything out of your time or or effort, and and so just uh, selecting foods that you will have to prepare, even stick your fingers in and, and cut and. and uh, ju- just having that full food experience uh, with the flavors and the spices and, and and preparing your own food. I mean, it's it's becoming a lost art. Uh, I would also actually recommend uh, Michael Pollan's uh, Netflix uh, series called Cooked. It's like a three-part miniseries that goes into our... Um, you know, our food history, the way we have traditionally prepared foods and how food has always been part of our uh, society and, and uh, you know, the, the, the source of our well-being um, and just spending more time preparing food and eating food makes it more of a fulfilling experience and that way can actually lead to health versus having food as sort of a byproduct of our modern stressful life where we eat to comfort ourselves and and, uh, we eat on the run and we eat in sort of this all out stressed uh, state of mind you know that's that's like two extreme ends of the spectrum and i think we need to move back to the to the more holistic the more um love of food you know love the food and the food will love you back uh, sort of mindset now for the most part you can follow me on my facebook page Uh, i have a private profile and i have an official coaching page so the burger a fagerly on facebook um i have a website on burgerfagerly.com that's not being updated very often and eventually i think it will be redirected to the cybernet cybernetic fitness.com if we ever get that finished um, the collabor- collaboration project with me and Menno Hansmans. Um, so, so yeah, uh, that and maybe my Instagram 
account uh, or even my Twitter account. Those would be my main sources of, um, you know, where, where to find me. All right, guys, I hope you enjoyed this episode with Berge and definitely make sure to check out his stuff on bergefagerli.no and keep an eye out on cybernetic fitness once that comes out. All right, guys, Abel here again. Hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, please subscribe on YouTube if you watched it there. I come out with new content every week there, whether it's in the form of a podcast episode like this, which I actually aim to do one off every week, or some shorter informational video. Also, if you could just leave a comment and suggest some people that you'd like me to interview or just topics you'd like me to cover, uh, it would be very helpful to know how I can better serve you. And if you listen to it in podcast, format if you could leave a rating on itunes it would greatly help out the show and i would be more than grateful for it so thanks guys for hanging out up until now thanks for being here and see you all next week